morning. This is Dr. Carol Reiser. I'll be uh, recording a Tegrity lecture for you on examination techniques and equipment. And this information is found in Chapter 3 of your Cydel text. The first uh, section refers to uh, ways to prevent infection. Uh, some of this is very familiar to you already since we uh, practice as nurses. So I'm going to let you read through and I'll just briefly um, touch on these these aspects, but that will be important for your knowledge. Um, standard precautions, of course, we all know what that is, used for the care of all patients, regardless of their presumed infection status. It can happen um, to anyone at any time uh, that they would become a source of infection and not be aware of it. Uh, these principles, uh, the precautions rather, of course, are based on the principle that all of the following may contain transmissible infectious agents. Any blood and body fluid, any secretion, any excretion except sweat, and of course the non-intact skin, as well as mucous membranes. In our hand hygiene, um, after touching blood and body fluids, secretions or excretions, contaminated items, we should immediately, after removing the gloves, um, consider your hand hygiene. Uh, many have been taught to wash your hands uh, for a couple of minutes, um, given the, the uh, little reminder to sing happy birthday to you twice all the way through, and that being sufficient to um, consider yourself cleansed. Um, and also between patient contacts, we should consider our hand hygiene. As far as personal protective equipment, um, gloves, gown, mask, and eye protection when there is um, any anticipated exposure. Uh, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. Um, we can instruct symptomatic patients to cover their mouth and nose when they sneeze or cough, to use tissues, um, to observe their own hand washing after soiling of hands, um, as well as our own when dealing with patients with respiratory secretions. And um, if, if possible, if tolerated, that patient uh, could wear a surgical mask and that we can always at least uh, maintain some spatial separation, maybe greater than three feet, if at all possible, to limit our own exposure. Um, safe injection practices, as well as the use of uh, masks for inserting catheters or injection of material into the spinal or epidural space, um, handling of equipment or items that are likely contaminated, um, this all will prevent the transmission of infectious agents. Transmission-based precautions, a second tier of precautions designed for the care of specified patients known or suspected to be infected by epidemiologically important pathogens. And this applies to pathogens spread by air, droplet, even on dry skin or contaminated surfaces. The incidence of serious allergic reaction to latex has uh, increased dramatically in the recent years. Latex allergy occurs when the body's immune system reacts to proteins found in natural rubber latex. Healthcare workers at, are at particular risk for developing this kind of allergy because of their exposure to latex in the form of gloves and other supplies. And we can become sensitized to um, latex uh, by direct skin or mucous membrane contact or through airborne exposure. It can cause rash, itching, blisters, asthma, GI symptoms, lung damage, and anaphylaxis. So we should, uh, if we are at risk to exposure to gloves or other latex supplies, be aware of this particular risk and what it could mean for you. Patients with multiple procedures or surgeries also become at an increased risk because of their uh, repeated exposures to latex. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the four 
uh, main areas of uh, the examination technique that we will be discussing, of course, are inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. We'll begin by talking about some of the patient positions and draping, um, seated, seated position, The patient should uh, have the drape cover her legs and lap, and it can be moved to uncover parts of the body that are examined. Uh, the supine position is when the patient lays on her, his or her back with your arms, his arms at the sides and legs extended. The drape should cover the patient from chest to knees or toes. The prone, the patient lies on his or her stomach, and this position may be useful for uh, special maneuvers such as part of the musculoskeletal exam. We should drape the patient to cover the torso. Dorsal recumbent uh, position can be used for the examination of genital or rectal areas and this is when the patient lies supine with knees bent and flat on the table. We should place the drape in a diamond position from chest to toes and then wrap each leg with the corresponding lateral corner of the diamond. The lateral recumbent is a side-lying position where the legs are extended or flexed and the left lateral recumbent position or may, uh, may be used in listening to heart sounds. So the patient's left side is down. In lithotomy, it's generally used for a pelvic exam. Variations of positioning are uh, discussed in later chapters. But you begin with the patient in the dorsal recumbent with feet at the corners of the table and then help the patient to stabilize her feet in the stirrups and slide her bottom down to the edge of the table and then go ahead and drape in the diamond position as uh, we talked about in the dorsal recumbent. The SIMS position can be used for examination of the rectum or obtaining rectal temperature. The patient starts in the lateral recumbent the torso is rolled toward a prone position, and then the top leg is flexed sharply at the hip and knee, and the bottom leg is flexed slightly. And we should drape the patient from shoulder to toes. Inspection is the process of observation. Your eyes and nose are sensitive tools for gathering data throughout the examination. And sometimes the first observation when entering an exam room may be an odor, either obvious and pervasive or subtle. The guidelines for uh, developing an adequate inspection technique, of course, include uh, adequate lighting, an unhurried and careful inspection, expose what we want to inspect, and validate those findings with the patient. Palpation involves the use of hands and fingers through the sense of touch, and certain parts of your hands are better than others for these specific types of palpation. The palmar surface and the finger pads are more sensitive than the fingertips and should be used whenever discriminatory touch is needed for um, examination. The guidelines for Palpation include keeping your fingernails short, having warm hands, being gentle in your approach, using the correct palpation depth, and also using appropriate hand surface. The ulnar surface of the hand and fingers is the most sensitive area for distinguishing vibration. The dorsal surface is best for estimating temperature. Of course, this estimate provides only a crude measure, and it's best used to detect temperature differences in comparing other parts of the body instead of what is the temperature. Um, that's also talking about um, the position, the texture, the size, consistency, fluid, crepitus, form of a mass or a structure is uh, what the palmar surface of the fingers of the hand with um, fingers and finger pads are best used for and the ulnar surfaces for vibration as I said and the dorsal for temperature. In percussion, <clears throat> which is one object striking against another and producing a vibration, 
sound waves can be heard as resonance, and that arises from a vibration. The density of the medium through which the sound waves travel determines the degree of percussion tone. The more dense the medium, the quieter the percussion tone. The percussion tone over, light, over air is loud, over fluid is less loud, and over solid is very soft. The degree of percussion tone is classified and ordered um, in, as per this list, with timpani being loud, high, and drum-like, like over a gastric bubble, hyperresonance being very loud, low, booming, as in emphysematous lungs, resonance being loud, low, and hollow, as in healthy lung tissue, dullness, which is soft, moderate, and thud-like, such as percussion over the liver, and then there's flatness, which is soft, high, or dull, like over muscle. You will need to know these particular tones and what you might hear over all of these examples and more. So be sure and go over that carefully in your book. Percussion techniques. They're the same regardless of the structure you're percussing and uh, immediate or direct percussion being the finger striking directly against the body part. Immediate or indirect percussion is where the middle finger of the dominant hand is the hammer and the middle finger of the non-dominant hand is placed on the body and struck. That's indirect. Then the fist is the non-dominant hand is placed on the body and then struck with the fist of the dominant hand. And this is most commonly used to elicit tenderness arising from certain uh, body organs. Auscultation, of course, involves the listening to the sounds produced by the body. And some of these sounds, such as speech, are audible to the unassisted ear, but most require a stethoscope to augment the sounds. Guidelines for auscultation are to perform last in the examination sequence, except with the abdominal examination. That we should perform first. The stethoscope is placed on the naked skin. We should listen for the presence or the characteristics of sound and give yourself time to identify each. You should listen to one sound at a time and listen to the characteristics of that sound and be sure you have that well in hand before you move to the next area. And don't anticipate the next sound, just listen and evaluate. The pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and temperature are considered to be the baseline indicators of a patient's health status, and these are why they're called vital signs. Um, the pulse, of course, can be palp palp palpated in several areas, it measures the heart rate, the respiration, measure of inspiration, expiration, that's one respiration. Blood pressure, the peripheral measurement of the cardiovascular function. And here I want to point out uh, that we probably all need to review the use of the appropriate size blood pressure cuff. Um, there are sizes from a large adult um, to child and infant and even neonatal cuffs. So we should um, use the appropriate size. And of course, temperature is measuring the body's core temperature indirectly, generally. Um, it can indicate infection or be a, even a diagnostic indicator, especially with infants, toddlers, and older adults. We can measure it um, most commonly oral, uh, sometimes rectal, axillary, and tympanic, all of which are indirect measures of the core temperature. Pain, because of its ubiquitous nature, um, its universality as a distress signal, and its frequency as a chief complaint, is more and more often being recognized as the fifth vital sign. Uh, oxygen saturation um, can be estimated through pulse oximetry, 
um, a non-invasive measure of the relative amount of light absorbed by oxyhemoglobin and unoxygenated hemoglobin. Um, a healthy person with no anemia or lung disease generally has uh, oxygen saturation of 97 to 99 percent. Height and weight of adults are measured on a standing platform scale and uh, there is, a, of course, electronic scales as well. Um, infants on a platform scale sitting or lying, um, height on the measuring device with rigid headboard or movable footboard or measuring pads. And this um, is described on page 57 of your text. I'll let you read a little more about the devices used to measure length for an infant. A child, when able to stand, uh, the stadiometer, or a stature measuring device, um, which includes a movable headpiece attached to a rigid measurement bar and platform, um, is used to measure height. And modifications on patients with disabilities. Um, depending on, of course, what the disability is, we should speak directly to the patient, um, have adequate space, have appropriate equipment, and suggest appropriate clothing. Um, we should keep some considerations in mind about the environment and the encounter, including the things I've mentioned. Um, and depending on what kind of examination is necessary, um, for instance, for a pelvic exam, a woman could wear an easily removable skirt or a pair of pants, a button-up or zippered shirt would facilitate the breast exam. So all of those things um, can be suggested to the patient or the caregiver uh, ahead of time in order to make physical assessment easier for someone with disabilities. Patients with uh, mobility impairment um, of course, you can utilize all these ways to uh, move someone, the pivot transfer, the cradle transfer, two-person transfer, and equipment such as um, the sideboard. And of course, the slide board is used when um, to form a bridge between the wheelchair and the exam table. Um, for that to work, of course, the table and the chair must be about the same height and to in order to slide the person over. Um, perhaps a two-person transfer or a pivot transfer might work better, depending on the situation. For patients with sensory uh, impairment, we should first discuss with the patient what kind of communication or decide what kind of communication device will be used, such as sign language through an interpreter, the use of a word board or a talk box of some kind. Um, there's braille, um, audio taped information, three-dimensional models, and so forth. Um, impaired hearing or speech, we should allow the patient to choose uh, the appropriate form of communication and for impaired vision, we should identify ourselves clearly. We should orient our patient to the surroundings and uh, be aware that there could be uh, the use of canes or walkers or even guide animals. Uh, some of the special concerns mentioned are bowel and bladder concerns, autonomic hyperreflexia, um, which is uh, common in people with spinal cord injuries, um, hypersensitivities, uh, which could cause discomfort and spasms, uh, and spasticity itself, which is a spasm in a particular kind of disability. It can range from a tremor to a violent contraction, but spasms can occur during a transfer or if the patient's in an awkward position. So we should always take those things into consideration. Instruments. Uh, this is the list 
um, of instruments used in physical exam. Stethoscope being the first in the list required for amplification and auscultation, of course. And there's four types, acoustic, magnetic, electronic, and stereophonic. The acoustic is a closed cylinder with, that transmits sound from the source along its column to the ear. Its rigid diaphragm has a natural frequency of about 300 hertz, and it screens out low-pitched sounds, and best transmits high-pitched sounds, such as the second heart sounds. The bell piece, with which the skin acts as a diaphragm, has a natural frequency ranging uh, or varying with the amount of pressure exerted. So with the bell, you don't want to press on the stethoscope so hard that it, the bell uh, contacts the skin. The skin itself is considered the diaphragm of the bell of the stethoscope. stethoscope. Um, the magnetic stethoscope has a single end piece that is a diaphragm, and it has an iron disc on the interior surface, and behind this is a permanent magnet. And a, and a spring keeps the diaphragm bowed outward when it is not compressed against the body surface. Compression of the diaphragm activates the air column as magnetic attraction is established between the disc and the magnet. <clears throat> By rotating dials for high, low, and full frequency sounds, you can get your best um, auscultation. The electronic stethoscope picks up vibrations transmitted to the surface of the body and converts them into electrical signals. Uh, newer versions of the electronic stethoscope can provide uh, other features such as um, long listening ranges, um, digital readouts, sound recording. You can even store and play back uh, sounds and link this to your computer where you can save it. <clears throat> Pulse oximeter, uh, of course, as we said, measures the percentage of um, hemoglobin saturated with oxygen. It's a measurement for how much, the, how much oxygen the blood is carrying as a percentage of the maximum it could carry. Um, it requires a reasonably translucent site with a good blood flow, and typically we use the finger uh, or toe, even the pen, penna of the ear. And I've even seen people use the forehead for picking up pulse, pulse oximeter readings. Dopplers, um, when some sounds are too difficult to auscultate with a regular stethoscope, you might use a Doppler. It detects blood flow rather than sounds. Some of the common uses for a Doppler would be to detect systolic blood pressures, to auscultate fetal heart tones, to locate pulsatile vessels, to take weak pulses, and assess um, vessel patency. Fetal monitoring equipment um, is used, of course, to determine the fetal heart rate, and there's four types. The fetoscope, the left, the stethoscope, and the Doppler. <clears throat> the fetoscope has a bandwidth has a band, excuse me, that fits against the head of the listener and makes handling of the instrument unnecessary. So you just put your, put it on your head, lean down and listen to the fetal heart tones. Uh, the metal band aids in bo a bone conduction of sound so that the heart tones can be heard more easily. Now the left scope has a weighted end when placed on the abdomen. It does not need to be stabilized by, by the clinician so you don't have to touch it. These two can be uh, detect fetal heart rate at 17 to 19 weeks gestation. The Doppler employs the continuous ultrasound method that picks up differing frequencies from the beating fetal heart. It's more sensitive and can detect fetal heart rates at 10 to 12 weeks of gestation and even earlier sometimes. And the ophthalmoscope, 
is a system of lenses and mirrors with light sources, light source and apertures that enable visualization of the interior structures of the eye. And the lenses vary, of course, in magnification from 20, minus 20 to plus 40. And you can dial up or down to co compensate for myopia or hyperopia in both the examiner and the patient. The stra strabismoscope is used for detecting strabismus and can be used as part of the eye testing in children. You should tell the child to focus on an, un, on an accommodative target such as a wall poster and turn on the strabismoscope, place it over the patient's eye. Because of a one-way mirror, you're able to see in, but the patient can't see out. As a result, subtle eye movements associated with strabismus are more easily detected. With the strabismoscope in place, watch for the movement in both the covered and uncovered eye, and then repeat with the other eye. The visual acuity charts, such as the Snellen uh, alphabet chart, is used for screening and examination of vision. And it must be used with literate, verbal, and English-speaking adults and school-age children. The chart contains letters of graduated sizes with standardized numbers at the end of each line of letters. And these numbers indicate the degree of visual acuity when read from a distance of 20 feet. And some charts, of course, are standardized for 10 feet, but we're going to talk about the 20 feet standardization. Um, reading is recorded as a fraction. Uh, 20 over 20 is normal. That's 2020 vision. The larger the denominator, the poorer the vision. The tumbling E is a non-alphabet version of the Snellen chart. The tumbling E has the capital letter E facing in different directions, and the person being tested must determine which direction the E is pointing, up, down, right, left, and they hold out three or four fingers to mimic the letter and then point the direction that the letter, they see the letter pointing. HOTV um, is a wall chart composed only of H's, O's, T's, and V's. And the child points to or matches the correct letter on the testing board. The LH symbols or LEA symbols uh, consist of four optotypes a circle, square, apple, and a house that blur equally. And the child has to find a matching block or point to the shape that matches the target presented. The visual acuity is determined by the smallest symbols that the child is able to identify accurately at 10 feet. For example, if the child is able to identify the 10 out of 15 symbols at 10 feet, then the child's visual acuity is 10 over 15, or 20 over 30. If it's not possible to perform the testing at 10 feet, move closer until he or she has identified the largest target, the largest symbol, and then proceed down in size to the smallest symbols. We should record the acuity as the smallest symbol identified on the bottom number and the testing distance on the top number. For example, correctly identifying the 10 over 15 symbols at 5 feet is recorded as 5 over 15, or 20 over 60. Broken wheel cards. The broken wheel test consists of six pairs of cards with the following acuities, 20 over 100, 20 over 80, 20 over 60, 20 over 40, 20 over 30, and 20 over 20. In each pair, one card has solid wheels while the other has Lando C or broken wheels. The child identifies the card that has the broken wheels on the pictured car. Record the acuity of the card with the smallest car for which the child can distinguish the broken wheels. And for the some of these, um, just to make yourself aware of exactly what we're talking about, um, go to the Evolve website, and they will show you um, very specific examples, which can clarify. To assess near vision, um, 
the Rosenbaum or Jaeger chart can be used, or simply a newspaper print, newsprint. The Rosenbaum contains a series of numbers, E's, X's, and O's, and graduated sizes. And we test and record vision for each eye separately, just as in the others. Uh, acuity is recorded as either distance equivalents, such as 2020, or Jaeger equivalents, such as J2. Both these measures are indicated on the chart. If newsprint is used, the patient should be able to read it without difficulty. The Amsler grid is a screening test for people with uh, at risk for macular degeneration, and it's uh, the grid monitors about 10 degrees of central vision and is used when retinal drusen bodies are seen during an ophthalmologic ophthalmological examination or when there's a strong family history of macular degeneration. The grid itself consists of straight lines that resemble graph paper. At the center of the grid is a black dot that acts as a fixation point. The patient views the grid with one eye at a time and notes the occurrence of line distortion or actual scotoma. The otoscope provides elimination for examining the external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane. The traditional otoscope head is seated in the handle in the same manner as the ophthalmoscope and is turned on in the same way. <clears throat> the otoscope can be used also for nasal examination if a nasal speculum is available. If a nasal speculum is not available, we should use the shortest, widest speculum and insert, insert it gently into the nair. The pneumatic attachment for the otoscope is used to evaluate the fluctuating capacity of the tympanic membrane. This is when a short piece of rubber tubing is attached to the head of the otoscope and a hand bulb attached to the other end of the tubing. And when you squeeze it, it produces puffs of air that cause the tympanic membrane to move. A tympanometer uh, measures uh, or, or rather screens, oh, excuse me here, assesses the function of the ossicular chain, the eustachian tube, and the tympanic membrane. The probe should be positioned at the opening of the ear canal where it measures sound energy and air pressure as each is introduced into the ear. A tympanogram is a graphic representation of the change in compliance of the middle ear system as air pressure is varied. The tympanogram results are displayed on the probe monitor and they can be printed out to produce a hard copy. The nasal speculum is used with a pen light to visualize the lower and middle turbinates of the nose. Uh, you open the blades by squeezing the handle of the instrument. Stabilize the speculum with your index finger to avoid contact with the blade of the blades with the nasal septum, which is very uncomfortable. Tilt the patient's head at various angles to uh, visualize. Tuning forks are used in screening tests for auditory function and for vi vibratory sensation as part of the neurologic exam. As tuning forks are activated, vibrations are created that produce a particular frequency of sound wave, and that's expressed in cycles per second or hertz. Thus, a fork of 512 hertz vibrates 512 cycles per second. For auditory evaluation, use a fork with a frequency of 500 to 1000 hertz because it can estimate hearing loss in the range of normal speech which is approximately 300 to 3,000 hertz. Forks of lower frequency can cause you to overestimate bone conduction and can be felt as vibration as well as heard. You activate the fork by gently squeezing and stroking the prongs or by tapping them against the knuckles of your hand so that they ring softly. Because touching the tines will dampen the sound, the fork must be held at the base. <clears throat> the percussion hammer um, is used to test deep tendon reflexes. 
Hold the hammer loosely between the thumb and index finger so the hammer moves in a swift arc and in a controlled direction. As you tap the tendon, use a rapid downward snap of the wrist, tap quickly and firmly, and then snap your wrist back so the hammer does not linger on the tendon. The tap should be brisk and direct, and you need to practice this in order to achieve a smooth and rapid in one controlled motion. You can either use the pointed or the flat end of the hammer. The flat end, of course, would be more comfortable when striking the patient directly, and the pointed end is useful in small areas, such as on your finger placed over the patient's bicep tendon. Your finger can also act as a reflex hammer, and this can be particularly useful when you're examining very young patients because it's less threatening to a child than a hammer. Many pediatric specialists let the child hold the hammer while they use their fingers. A variant of the percussion hammer is the neurologic hammer, which is also used for testing deep tendon reflexes. The hammer has two additional features that make it a multi-purpose neurologic instrument. The base of the handle unscrews, revealing a soft brush. A tiny knob on the head also unscrews, to which is attached a sharp needle. These additional implements were designed to determine sensory perception as part of the neurologic exam. The brush can still be used for that purpose. However, because of the possibility of cross-infection, the needle should not be used at all. Instead, use a, use a disposable needle, a pen, or the sharp end of a broken tongue blade. A tape measure 7 to 12 millimeters wide is used for determining circumference, length, and diameter. It may be helpful to have one that measures in both inches and metric units. Tape measures, of course, are available in any number of materials, from paper to cloth. Uh, the, the tape should be non-stretchable and pliable um, and be sure there's no sharp edges because you place it directly against the skin and it can cut a patient. When measuring, make sure the tape is not caught or wrinkled under the patient and pull the tape closely but not tightly enough to cause depression. Serial measurements obtained by placing tape, the tape in the same location every time can be recorded as well. A trans illuminator consists of a strong light source with a narrow beam. The beam is directed at a particular body cavity and is used to differentiate between various media present in that cavity. Air, fluid, and tissue differentially transmit light. This allows you to detect the presence of fluid in sinuses, the presence of blood or masses in the scrotum, and abnormalities of the, in the cranium of infants. Specific transluminating uh, instruments are available, or a flashlight with a rubber adapter can be used. <clears throat> it's fine also, when the situation calls for it, to use just a plain old flashlight or a pin light. Do not use a light source with a halogen bulb, however, because the, it can burn the patient. Place the beam of light directly against the area to be observed, shielding the beam with your hand if necessary. Watch for the red glow of light through the body cavity. Note the presence or absence of illumination and any irregularities. And there's a clinical pearl in your book that talks mm -hmm. about transillumination. And it says, compared to radiologic imaging technology, transillumination may seem archaic and imprecise. Radiologic imaging is to be used when necessary, of course, but transillumination maintains its value as a clinical tool and is far less expensive. A vaginal speculum is composed of two blades and a handle, and there are three basic types of specula. Um, they can be used to view the vaginal canal and the cervix. The Graves speculum is uh, available in several sizes with blades ranging from three and a half to five inches in length and three quarters to one and a quarter inches in width. The blades are curved with a space between the closed blades. 
<clears throat> the bottom blade is about a quarter inch longer than the top blade to conform to the lo longer posterior vaginal wall and to aid in visualization. The Peterson speculum has blades that are as long as those of the Graves speculum, but are both narrower and flatter. And this is particularly helpful for examination of women with small vaginal openings. Pediatric or virginal specula are smaller in all dimensions with short, narrow, flat blades. Specula are dis available in either disposable plastic or reusable metal. And the metal speculum has two positioning devices. The top blade is hinged and a positioning thumb piece lever attached. And when you press down on the thumb piece, the di distal end of the blade rises, thus opening the speculum. The blade can be locked in an open position by tightening the thumb screw on the thumb piece. Moving the top blade up or down controls the degree of opening of the proximal end of the blades, and it's locked in place by another thumb screw on the handle. The plastic speculum operates differently. The bottom blade is fixed to, to a posterior handle, and an anterior lever handle controls the top blade. As you press on the lever, the distal end of the top blade elevates. At the same time, the, the base of the speculum also widens. The speculum is locked into position with a catch on the lever handle that snaps into place in a positioning groove. And you'll be, uh, become familiar with uh, the use and practice, be able to practice with both types in order to get comfortable with them before you um, do your first vaginal exam. <clears throat> the goniometer is used to determine the degree of joint flexion and extension, and this instrument consists of two straight arms that intersect and that can be angled and rotated around a, pro a protractor marked with degrees. We should place the center of the protractor over the joint and align the straight arms with the long axes of the extremities. The degree of angle flexion or extension is indicated on the protractor. The Woods lamp contains a light source with a wavelength of 360 nanometers. This is the black light that causes certain substances to fluoresce. It's used primarily to determine the presence of fungi on skin lesions. Darken the room, turn on the Woods lamp, and shine it on the area you're evaluating. A yellow-green fluorescence indicates the presence of fungi. Darkening the room can sometimes be intimidating, particularly to children. Children and their parents react positively when they know what to expect. And you can accomplish this by shining the lamp on something fluorescent, such as a non-digital watch, to give them the sense of what you're looking for. The dermatoscope is a skin surface microscope that uses epiluminescent microscopy, ELM, with or without the application of oil on a skin lesion to illuminate and magnify a lesion to get a more detailed inspection. Digital epiluminescence microscopy uses technology to not only examine the skin surface, but also view, image, record, and document subsurface layers and structures of the skin. Dermoscopy is used to confirm a diagnosis or determine which skin lesions require biopsy and which and require this one requires special training. Skin fold thickness calipers are designed to measure the thickness of sub-Q tissue at certain points of the body. Specifically calibrated and tested calipers such as the Lang and Arpendon models are used. The skin fold is pinched up so that the sides of the skin are parallel. Place the caliper edges at the base of the fold, being careful not to capture bone or muscle. Tighten the caliper so that they're grasping the skin fold but not compressing it. The specific techniques for trifold, for tricep skin fold thickness will be discussed later. The monofilament is a device test designed to test for loss of protective sensation, particularly on the plantar surface of the foot. It bends at a ten. Uh, it bends at ten grams of linear pressure. 
Patients who can't feel the application of the monofilament at the point that it bends have lost their protective sense and are at increased risk for in injury. We should test intact skin on the plantar surface of the foot at various areas, including the big toe, the heel, and the ball. Lock the monofilament in its handle at 90 degrees. With the patient's eyes closed, apply the monofilament perpendicular to the surface of the skin and press hard enough to allow the monofilament to, to bend. Application at test sites should be random and last approximately one and a half seconds. Have the patient indicate whether the monofilament is felt. Vary the interval between the applications and note the response in the patient record. Clean the monofilament with alcohol. <clears throat> This is a list uh, giving you some guidance on what equipment you may need to purchase. Students, uh, of course, you're confronted by a large number and variety of pieces of equipment for physical exam. Um, this list is only a guideline, and the price, of course, of stethoscopes, otoscopes, ophthalmoscopes, all of this varies widely. There's different models and so forth. Um, Part of this will be uh, given to you in a kit that you check out and return at the end of the semester. Uh, please be sure that all this equipment is cared for as if you had purchased it yourself because you do need to return it in good condition um, in order to get a grade for the, for the course. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to seeing you in the future.